Chapter Three, Part One of the Night Operator. This is a LibriVox recording. It is in the public domain. The Night Operator by Frank L. Packard. Chapter Three, Part One. The Apotheosis of Sammy Durgan. The only point in the Hill Division from Carlton the Super to the last car tink would admit it was at all hazy on as far as Sammy Durgan was concerned was why, in the everlasting name of everything, the man stuck to railroading. When the Hill Division got up against that point, it was floored and took the count. Sammy Durgan wore the belt. He had a record never equaled before or since. Tommy Regan, the master mechanic, who had a warped gift for metaphor, said the man was as migratory on jobs as a flock of crows in a poor year for corn, only a blame sight harder to get rid of. As far back as anybody could remember, they remembered Sammy Durgan. Somewhere on the division you were bound to bump up against him, but rarely twice in the same place. There wasn't anyone in authority, even so mild an authority as a section boss, who hadn't fired Sammy Durgan so often that it had grown on them like a habit. Not that it made much difference, however, for ejected from the roundhouse, Sammy Durgan's name would be found decorating the payroll next month in the capacity of baggage master, possibly, at some obscure spot up the line, and here, for example, a slight mix-up of checks in the baggage of a tourist family that divided the family against itself and its baggage as far as the east is from the west, and Sammy Durgan moved on again. What the Hill Division said about him would have been complimentary, if it hadn't been for the grin. They said he was an all-round railroad man. Shops, roundhouse, train crews, station work, and construction gangs— Sammy Durgan knew them all, and they knew Sammy Durgan. Eternally and everlastingly in trouble, that was Sammy Durgan. Nothing much else the matter with him, just trouble. Brains, all right, only as far as the Hill Division could make out, the last thing Sammy Durgan ever thought of doing was to give his brains a little exercise to keep them in condition. But if appalling in his irresponsibility, Sammy Durgan nevertheless had a saving grace. No cork ever bobbed more buoyantly on troubled waters than Sammy Durgan did on his sea of adversity. Sammy Durgan always came up smiling. He had a perennial sort of cheerfulness on his leathery face that infected his guileless blue eyes, while a mop of fiery red hair like a flaming halo kind of guaranteed the effect to be genuine. One half of you felt like kicking the man violently, and the other half was obsessed with an insane desire to hobnob with him just as violently. Sammy Durgan, to say the least of it, was a contradictory proposition. He had an ambition. He wanted a steady job. He mentioned the matter to Regan one day, immediately following that period in his career when doing odd jobs over at the station, he had, in filling up the fire buckets upstairs, inadvertently left the tap running. The sink being small and the flooring none too good, a cherished collection of Regan's blueprints in the room below were reduced to a woebegone mass of sticky pulp. Sammy Durgan mentioned his ambition as a sort of corollary, as it were, to the bitter and concise remarks in which the fat little master mechanic had just couched Sammy Durgan's ubiquitous discharge. Regan didn't stop breathing. He had dealt with Sammy Durgan before. Regan smiled as though it hurt him. "'A steady job, is it?' said Regan softly. "'I've been thinking so hard daytimes trying to place you in a railroad job.' and still keep railroading safe out in this part of the world that I've got to dreaming about it at nights. Last night I dreamt I was in a foundry, and there was an enormous vat of red, bubbling, liquid iron they'd just drawn off the furnace, and you came down from the ceiling on a spider web and hung over it. And then I woke up, and I was covered with cold sweat, for fear the web wouldn't break. Regan said Sammy Durgan, blinking fast. You don't know a man when you see one. You're where you are because you've had the chance to get there. Mind that, I've never had a chance. 
but it'll come regan and the day'll come regan when you'll be down on your knees begging me to take what i'm asking you for uh, now a, a steady job on your blessed railroad maybe said regan chewing absently on his black strap and then as a sort of afterthought what kind of a job a steady one said it sammy durgan doggedly i don't know just what but mm, said regan solicitously well don't make up your mind in a hurry durgan i don't want to press you when you've had a chance to look around a little more maybe you'll be able to decide better hmm? what get out sammy durgan backed to the door there he paused blinking fast again some day i'll show you regan and all the rest of them and get out said the little master mechanic peremptorily and sammy durgan got out he was always getting out that was his fort when he got in it was only to get out some day said sammy durgan and the hill division stuck its tongue in its cheek but sammy durgan had an answer to the blunt refusal that invariably greeted his modest request for a fresh job listen here said sammy durgan with a firm hold on the overall strap of it might be the bridge foreman he was trying to wheedle a time check out of twas regan fired me first but he was in a bad humor at the time tis the steam hose i was washing out boiler tubes within the roundhouse got away from me and it was accidental though maybe for the moment it was painful for him it just shows that if you get fired once it sticks to you as for them baggage checks out in moose peak well, they were no family there was a, a tribe about eighteen kids besides the pa and ma and fourteen baggage cars full of trunks well, he was a little bow-legged fellow with a scared look and he whispers when he wants the checks for about three minutes before train time then she comes in bigger than two elephants scorches him through a pair of glasses she carries on a handle and orders them checked somewhere else say was i to blame if some of them checks in the hurry didn't get the first name i'd written on em scratched out and over there to the station the time regan's office got flooded twasn't my fault if you get fired once you keep on getting fired no matter what you do i turned the tap off it was one of them little devils of call boys turned it on again but do you think anyone but would believe that <laughs> they would not i'd have mentioned it at the time if there's any trouble anywhere and i'm around it's put on to me and there's mrs durgan back there in big cloud she ain't very well cough's troubling her more than usual lately and worrying about the rent not being paid ain't helping her any say you'll give me a job won't you sammy durgan got the job now as may be inferred sammy durgan did not always adhere strictly to the truth not that he swerved from it with vicious intent but that like some other things trouble for instance the swerving had grown as it were to be a habit mrs durgan did not have a cough neither was she worrying about the unpaid rent mrs durgan speaking strictly in a physical sense was mightiest among women in big cloud and on the night the story proper opens a very black night for sammy durgan sammy durgan was sitting on mrs durgan's front doorstep and the door was locked upon him sammy durgan paradoxical as it may sound though temporarily out of a job again and with no job to be fired from was being fired at that moment harder than he had ever been fired before in his life and the firing was being done by mrs durgan it had been threatening for quite a while, quite a long while, two or three years, but it nonetheless came to Sammy Durgan with something of a shock, and he gasped. Mrs. Durgan was intensely Irish, from purer stock than Sammy Durgan, and through the window Mrs. Durgan spoke barbed words. "'Tis shame you used to take to yourself, Sammy Durgan, if you had the sense to take anything, the likes of you, a big, strong man. "'Tis years I put up with you, when another woman would not, but I'll put up with you no more. "'Tis the end this night, Sammy Durgan, and the holy mother be praised. "'There's no children to blush for the disgrace you are. Uh, "'Mariah,' said Sammy Durgan craftily, for this had worked before, "'do I drink?' 
Mrs. Durgan choked in her rage. I do not, said Sammy Durgan soothingly. And who but me lays the pay envelopes on your lap without so much as tearing them to count the insides of them? Listen here, Maria, listen. Is it mocking me, you are? shrieked Mrs. Durgan. It is little good the opening of them would do. Listen, is it, uh, to the smooth tongue of yous? I've listened till me fingers are bare to the bone with the wash tubs to cape the roof over me head. I'll listen no more, Sammy Durgan, mind that. Maria, said Sammy Durgan, with a softness that was meant to turn away wrath. Maria, open the door. I will not, said Mrs. Durgan with a truculent gasp. Never. Not well, yous live, Sammy Durgan, for yous funeral, maybe, but for no less than that, and then only for the joy of being a widdy. It sounded inevitable. There was a sort of cold uncompromise even in the fire of Mrs. Durgan's voice. Sammy Durgan rose heavily from the doorstep. Some day, said Sammy Durgan sadly, some day, Maria, you'll be sorry for this. You'll break your heart for it, Maria. You wait. Tis no fault of mine, the trouble. Everybody's against me, and now my wife. But you wait. Once in the life of every man he gets his chance. Mine ain't come yet. But you wait. It's the man who rises to an emergency that counts, and... There was a gurgling sound from Mrs. Durgan's throat, then the window slammed down, hard. Sammy Durgan stared stared a little blankly as the lamp retreated from the window and the front of the house grew black. "'I guess,' said Sammy Durgan a little wistfully to himself, "'I guess I'm fired all around for fair.' He turned and walked slowly out to the street and headed downtown toward the railroad yards, and as he walked he communed with himself somewhat bitterly, "'Any blamed little thing that comes up, that if it were anybody else, nobody'd pay any attention to it. And everybody yells, Fire Sammy Durgan. <laughs> That's me, Fire Sammy Durgan. And why? Because I never get a chance. That's why. Sammy Durgan grew earnest in his soliloquy. Some day, said he, as he reached the station platform, I'll show him. I'll show Maria. It'll come. Every man gets his chance. Give me the chance to rise to an emergency. That's all I ask. Just give me that, and I'll show them. Sammy Durgan walked up the deserted platform with no very definite destination in view, and stopped abruptly in front of the freight shed as he suddenly remembered that it was very late. He sat down on the edge of the platform and kicked at the main line rail with the toe of his boot. Sammy Durgan was bedless, penniless, wifeless, and jobless. It was a very black night indeed for Sammy Durgan. Sammy Durgan's mind catalogued those in authority in Big Cloud in whose gift a job was, and he went over the list. But it did not take him long, as he had need to hesitate over no single name. Big Cloud and a job for Sammy Durgan were separated by a great gulf. Sammy Durgan, however, his perennial optimism gaining the ascendancy again, found solace even in that fact. In view of his present marital difficulties, a job in Big Cloud would be an awkward thing anyhow. In fact, for the first time in his life, he would have refused a job in Big Cloud. Sammy Durgan had a certain pride about him. Given the opportunity, the roundhouse, the shops, the yards, and the train crews, once they discovered the little impasse that had arisen in the Durgan family, might be safely trusted to make capital out of it, at his expense. Sammy Durgan's mind in search of a job went further afield. This was quite a different proposition, for the mileage of the Hill Division was big. For an hour Sammy Durgan sat there, scratching at his red hair, puckering his leathery face, and kicking at the rail to the detriment of the toe cap of his boot. He knew the division well, very well, too well. At the moment he could not place any spot upon it that he did not know, or perhaps what was more to the point that was not intimately acquainted with him. Road work, bridge work, yard work, station work passed in review before him, but always and with each one arose a certain well-remembered face whose expression, biblically speaking, 
was not like unto a father's on the prodigal's return. And then at last Sammy Durgan sighed in relief. There was Pat Donovan. True, he and Pat Donovan had had a little misunderstanding incident to the premature explosion of a keg of blasting powder that had wrecked the construction shanty, but that was two years ago and under quite different conditions. Pat Donovan was now a section boss on a desolate stretch of track about five stations up the line, and his only companions were a few Polacks who spoke English like parrots, voluble enough as far as it went, but not entirely soul-filling to an Irishman of the social tendencies of Pat Donovan. He could certainly get a job out of Pat Donovan. The matter ultimately settled. Sammy Durgan stood up. Across the yards they were making up the early morning freight. That solved the transportation question. A railroad man, whether he was out of a job or not, could always get a lift in any caboose that carried the markers or the tail lights of old Bill Wallace's train. Sammy Durgan got a lift that morning up to Dam River, and there a little further along the line he ran Pat Donovan and his Pollocks to earth where they were putting in some new ties. Donovan, a squat, wizened, red eyelidded little man with a short, bristling crop of sandy whiskers circling his jaws like an ill-trimmed hedge, hurriedly drew back the hand he had extended as he caught the tail end of Sammy Durgan's greeting. "'Oh, a job, is it?' he inquired without enthusiasm from his seat on a pile of ties beside the track. "'Listen here, Pat,' said Sammy Durgan brightly. "'Listen to—' "'Yes, have your nerve, which is?' observed the section boss caustically. "'Yes, put me in mind of a filly I had working for me once, for yes, I a dead spit of him, Sammy Durgan, that blew the roof off of the construction shanty, and—' "'Well, that was two years ago, Donovan,' interposed Sammy Durgan hurriedly. "'And you've no blasting powder on this job, and it was no fault of mine. I would have explained it at the time, but you were a bit hot under the collar, Pat, and you would not listen.' I was but testing the detonator box, and twas yourself told me the connections were not made. Did I? The section boss was watching his chattering gang of foreigners with gradually narrowing eyes. You did, asserted Sammy Durgan earnestly, and— Sammy Durgan stopped. Donovan had leaped from his seat and was gesticulating fiercely at his gold-earing, greasy-haired, laboring crew. Yes, I rapes! yelled, dancing frantically up and down. Yes, there are wrong good things, and yes talk like a cage full of monkeys. Yes look like men, but yes are not. Yes are anything that has no brains. Have I not told yes till me throat's cracked too, and uh, you ye are not required to lift the whole damned right away to put in a single measly tie. Is it a lump like a camel's back? Yes, a try and make in the rail. Here, dig here. The little section boss, with wrathful precision, indicated the exact spot with the toe of his boot. He returned to his seat and regarded Sammy Durgan helplessly. "'This is a new lot," said he sadly, "'and the worst bar none that ever I had.' Oh, "'But an Irishman, and one that can talk your own tongue, you won't hire when he's out of a job,' insinuated Sammy Durgan reproachfully. The section boss scrubbed reflectively at his chin whiskers. And uh, how's Mrs. Durgan? he asked with some cordiality. Oh, she's bad, said Sammy Durgan, suddenly mournful and shaking his head. She's worse than she's ever been, Donovan. I felt bad at leaving her last night, Donovan. I did that. But what could I do? It was a job I had to get, Donovan. Bad as I felt at leaving her, Donovan. Sure now. Is that so? said the little section boss sympathetically. Does cruel hard luck is have, Durgan. But you mind I've not much in the way of jobs. Tis a desolate bit of country, and mostly track walking at a dollar ten a day. Donovan, said Sammy Durgan from a full heart, the day'll come, Donovan, when I'll keep the grass green on your grave for this. I knew you'd not throw an old friend down. Um, Tis glad I am to do it, said Donovan, waving his hand royally. And yes can start at once. And Sammy Durgan started. And for a week Sammy Durgan assiduously tramped his allotted mileage out and back to the section shanty each day, and for a week Sammy Durgan and Trouble were asunder. 
Trouble? Where? From what possible source could there be any trouble? Not a soul for miles around the section shanty, just mountains and track and cuts and fills, and nothing on earth for Sammy Durgan to do but keep a paternal eye generally on the roadbed. Trouble? It even got monotonous for Sammy Durgan himself. "'Tis not," confided Sammy Durgan to himself one morning after a week of this, that found him plodding along the track some two miles east of the section shanty. "'Tis not precisely the job I'd like, for it's the chance I'm looking for to show em, Maria and Regan, and the rest of em, and there'll be no chance here. But temporarily it'll do. "'Tis not much of a job, and beneath me at that. "'But have I not heard that them as are as faithful in little "'will some day be handed much? "'There'll be no one to say,' he glanced carefully around him in all directions, "'that Sammy Durgan was not a good track-walker. "'Sammy Durgan sat down on the edge of the embankment, "'extracted a tiny cutty from his pocket, charged it with very black tobacco, lit it, tamped the top of the bowl with a calloused forefinger, and from another pocket extracted a newspaper, one of a bundle that the train crew of number 7 thoughtfully heaved at the section shanty door each morning on their way up the line. It was a warm, bright morning, one of those comfortable summer mornings with just enough heat to lift a little simmering haze from the rails, and just enough sun to make a man feel leisurely, so to speak, Sammy Durgan, the cutty drawing well, wormed a comfortable and inviting hollow in the gravel of the embankment, propped his back against an obliging tie, and opened his paper. "'Track walking,' said Sammy Durgan, "'is not much of a job, and tis not what I'm looking for, but there are worse jobs.' Somebody had read the paper before as Sammy Durgan, hence the sheet that first presented itself to his view was a page of classified advertisements. His eye roved down the column of situations vacant and held on one of them. Men wanted for grading work at the Gap. Apply at Engineer's Office Big Cloud or to T. H. McMurtry, Foreman, at the Gap. Sammy Durgan pursed his lips. "'There's no telling,' said Sammy Durgan thoughtfully, "'when I'll be looking for a new job, so I'll bear it in mind. "'Not that they'd give me a job at the office, for they would not, "'but uh, the name of him, this uh, T. H. McMurtry, "'will be a new man and unknown to me, which is quite another matter. "'I'll keep it in mind.' Sammy Durgan turned the sheet absently, and then, forgetful of the obliging tie that propped his back, he sat bolt upright with a jerk. "'For the love of Mike!' observed Sammy Durgan breathlessly, with his eyes glued to the paper. It leaped right out at him in the biggest type the Big Cloud Daily Sentinel had to offer, which, if it had its limitations, was not to be despised, since it had acquired a second-hand font or two from a metropolitan daily east that made no pretense at being modest in such matters. Sammy Durgan's eyes began to pop, and his leathery face to screw up. Ghastly railroad tragedy. Unknown man murdered in stateroom of eastbound flyer. No clue to assassin. Sammy Durgan's eyes bored into the fine print of the story. If the style was a trifle provincial and harrowing, Sammy Durgan was not fastidious enough to be disturbed thereby. It was intensely vivid. Sammy Durgan's mouth was half open, and he read... One of the most atrocious, daring, and bloody murders in the annals of the country's crime was perpetrated last night in a compartment of the sleeping car on number 12, the eastbound through express. It is a baffling mystery, though suspicion is directed against a passenger who gave his name as Samuel Stark of New York. The details, gathered by the Sentinel staff from Conductor Hurley and Clements the Porter, on the arrival of the train at Big Cloud are as follows. The car was a new type compartment car, with the compartment doors opening off the corridor that runs along one side of the length of the car. As the train was passing Dam River, Clements, the porter, at the forward end of the car, thought he heard two revolver shots from somewhere in the rear. Clements says he thought at first he had been mistaken, for the train was traveling fast and making a great uproar and he did not at once make any effort to investigate. 
Then he heard a compartment door open, and he started down the corridor. Stark was standing in the doorway of B compartment where the murdered man was, and Stark yelled at Clements, Here, Porter, quick! is what Clements said Stark said to him. There's a man been shot in here. My compartment's next to his, you know, and I heard two shots and rushed in. It was a horrible and unnerving sight that greeted the porter's eyes. Mr. Clements was still visibly affected by it, as he talked to the sentinel reporter in Big Cloud. The unknown murdered man lay pitifully huddled on the floor, lifeless and dead, a great bullet wound in one temple and another along the side of his neck that must have severed the juggler vein. It was as though blood had rained upon the victim. He was literally covered with it. He was already past aid, being quite dead. Conductor Hurley was quickly summoned, but investigation only deepened the mystery. Suicide was out of the question because there was no weapon to be found. Mr. Stark, at his own request, was searched, but had no revolver. Mr. Stark, however, has been held by the police. The sentinel, without wishing to infringe upon the sphere of the authorities or cast aspersions upon their acumen, but in the simple furtherance of justice, offers the suggestion that as the compartment window was open, the assassin, whoever he was, hurled the revolver out of the window after committing his dastardly and unspeakable crime, and the sentinel hereby offers twenty-five dollars reward for the recovery of the revolver. Lawlessness and crime, we had fondly believed, were stamped out of the West, and we raise our voice in protest against the return of desperados, bandits, and train robbers, and we solemnly warn all those of that caliber that they will not be tolerated in the new West, and we call upon all public-spirited citizens in whose veins red blood flows to rise up and put them down with an iron and merciless... There were still three columns. Sammy Durgan read them voraciously. At the end, he sucked hard on the black cutty. The black cutty was out. To think of the likes of that, muttered Sammy Durgan heavily, as he dug for a match. The fellow that wrote the piece, twill be that little squint-eyed runt Labatt, is not the fool I thought him. It's right he is. What with murders and desperados, no man's life safe, it is not. And to think of it right on this same railroad, and who knows? Sammy Durgan rose with sudden haste. But twas right on this same spot where I am this blessed minute, for the paper says it was close to Dam River, that the poor devil was shot dead and foully killed, and a match flamed over the bowl of the cutty, but Sammy Durgan's attention was not on it. Sammy Durgan, in a sort of strained way, descended the embankment. The match burned his fingers, and Sammy Durgan dropped it. Sammy Durgan rubbed his eyes. Yes, it was still glistening away there in the sunlight. He stooped, and from the grass, trembling a little with excitement, picked up a heavy-calibered, nickel-trimmed revolver. "'Holy Christmas!' whispered Sammy Durgan, blinking fast. "'Tis the same. There's no doubt of it. Tis the same that done the bloody deed. And tis the first bit of luck I've had since I was born. Twenty-five dollars reward!' He said it over very softly again. Twenty-five dollars reward!' Sammy Durgan returned to the track and resumed his way along it though as far as his services to the road were concerned, he might just as well have remained where he was. Sammy Durgan's thoughts were not of loosened spikes and erring fish plates, and neither were his eyes intent on their discovery. His mind, thanks to Labatt, of the Big Cloud Daily Sentinel, teemed with scenes of violence vividly portrayed, midnight murders, corpses in grotesque attitudes on gore-bespattered compartment floors, desperados of all descriptions, train bandits and train robbers in masks holding up trains. "'Tis true,' said Sammy Durgan to himself. "'Tis a lawless country, these same Rockies. I mind t'was only a year ago that Black Dempsey and his gang tried to wreck number two in the cut near Coyote Bend. I mind it well. Sammy Durgan walked on down the track. At intervals he took the revolver from his pocket and put it back again, as though to ensure himself beyond peradventure of doubt that it was in his possession. 
twenty-five dollars reward, communed Sammy Durgan, grown arrogant with wealth. Tis near a month's pay at a dollar ten, and all for the picking of it up. I called in luck. But it is not luck. An ordinary track walker would have walked by it and not seen it. Tis what you get for keeping your eyes about you, and besides the twenty-five, tis promotion, too, maybe I'll get. Twill show them that there's track walkers and track walkers. I'll say to Regan, Regan, I'll say, you've said hard words to me, Regan, but I ask you, Regan, how many track walkers would have brought a bloody murderer to justice by keeping their eyes about them in the faithful performance of their duty, Regan? Tis but the chance, I ask. "'Tis the man in an emergency that counts, "'and if ever I get a chance at an emergency, I'll show you.' "'And, and Regan will say, Sammy, he'll say, you—' "'Sammy Durgan paused in his engrossing soliloquy "'as the roar of an approaching train fell on his ears, "'and he scrambled quickly down from the right-of-way "'to the bottom of the embankment. "'Just ahead of him was a short, narrow, high-walled rock cut, "'and at the further end the track swerved sharply to the right, sidestepping, as it were, the twist of the dam river that swung in, steep bank, to the right of way. "'I'll wait here,' said Sammy Durgan, "'till she's through the cut.' Sammy Durgan waited. The train came nearer and nearer, and then Sammy Durgan cocked his head in a puzzled way and started through the cut. He couldn't see anything, of course, for the curve, but from the sound she had stopped just beyond the cut. "'Now what the devil is she stopping there for?' inquired Sammy Durgan of the universe in an injured tone. He started along through the cut, and then Sammy Durgan stopped himself, as though he were rooted to the earth, and a sort of grayish white began to creep over his face. Came echoing through the cut a shout, a yell, another, a chorus of them, then a shot, another shot, a fusillade of them, and then a din mingling the oaths, the yells, and the shots into a hideous babel that rang terror in Sammy Durgan's ears. Sammy Durgan promptly sidled in and hugged up against the rock wall that towered above him. Here he hesitated an instant, then he crept cautiously forward. Where he could not see, it was axiomatic that he could not be seen, and where he could not be seen, it was equally logical that he would be safe. Sammy Durgan's face, quite white now, was puckered as it had never been puckered before, and his lips moved in a kind of twitching, jerky way as he crept along. Then suddenly a voice that seemed nearer than the others but which, from the acoustic properties of the cut, he could not quite locate, bawled out fiercely over the confusion, prefaced with an oath, "'Get that express car door open and be damn quick about it! Go on, shoot along the side of the train every time you see a head in a window!' Sammy Durgan's mouth went dry, and his heart lost a beat, then went to pounding like a trip-hammer. The bat and the big cloud daily sentinel hadn't drawn any exaggerated picture. A hold-up! in broad daylight holy mother whispered sammy durgan he crept further forward very cautiously still farther and then he lay full length crouched against the rock wall at the end of the cut he could see now and the red hair of sammy durgan kind of straggled down damp over his forehead and his little black eyes lost their pupils it was a passenger train one side of it quite hidden by the sharp curve of the track the other side presented almost full on to Sammy Durgan's view, the whole length of it, and Sammy Durgan, gasping, stared. Not ten yards away from the mouth of the cut, a huge pile of ties were laid across the rails, and the pilot of the stalled engine almost nosing them. Down the embankment, a very steep embankment where the damn river swirled along, marched there evidently at the revolver's point. The engine crew stood with their hands up in the air at the revolver's point with a masked man behind it. Along the length of the train, two or three more masked men were shooting past the windows in curt intimation to the passengers that the safest thing they could do was to stay where they were. And further down, by the rear coach, the conductor and two brakemen, like their mates of the engine crew, held their hands steadfastly above their heads as another bandit covered them with his weapon. And through the open door of the express car, Sammy Durgan could see bobbing heads and straining backs, and the express company's safe being worked across the floor, preparatory to heaving it out on the ground. It takes a long time to tell it. Sammy Durgan got it all as a second flies. And something, a bitter something, seemed to be gnawing at Sammy Durgan's vitals. Holy Miller, 
he mumbled miserably. "'Tis an emergency, all right, but tis not the right kind of an emergency. What could any one man do against a lot of bloodthirsty, desperate devils like that, that'd sooner cut your throat than look at you?' Sammy Durgan's hand inadvertently rubbed against his right-hand coat pocket, and his revolver. He drew it out mechanically, and it seemed to put new life into Sammy Durgan, for as he stared again at the scene before him, Sammy Durgan quivered with a sudden fierce elation. "'I was wrong,' said Sammy Durgan grimly. "'Tis the right kind of an emergency, after all, and tis the man that uses his head and rises to one that counts.' I'll show em Mariah and Regan and the rest of them. That gore it can be done. Tis no one'll notice me while I'm getting to the engine and climbing in on the other side. And by glory, if I back her out quick enough, them thieving hellions in the express car can either jump for it or ride back to the arms of authority at the next station. But the safe will be there, and twill be Sammy Durgan that kept it there. But Sammy Durgan still lay on the ground and stared while the safe was being pushed to the express car door, and one edge of it already protruded out from the car. "'Go on, Sammy Durgan,' urged Sammy Durgan anxiously to himself. "'Don't you be scared, Sammy. You got a revolver. "'Tis yourself and not Mariah that'll do the locking of the doors hereafter, "'and Regan you can pass with fine contempt. "'Think of that, Sammy Durgan. "'And all for a bit of a run that'll not take the time of a, a batting of an eyelash, and with no one to notice you doing it. Oh, tis a clever plan you've devised, Sammy Durgan. It is that. Go on, Sammy. Go on. Sammy Durgan wriggled a little on the ground and cocked his revolver and wriggled a little more. I will, said Sammy Durgan with a sudden pinnacling of a determination, and he sprang to his feet. Some loosened shale rattled down behind him. Sammy Durgan dashed through the mouth of the cut, and then for a moment all was a sort of chaos to Sammy Durgan. From the narrow edge of the embankment, just clear of the cut, a man stepped suddenly out. Sammy Durgan collided with him. His cocked revolver went off, and jerked from his grasp by the shock, sailed riverwards through the air, while, echoing its report from the express car door, a man screamed wildly and grabbed at a bullet-shattered wrist. And the man with whom Sammy Durgan had collided, having but precarious footing at best, reeled back from the impact, smashed into another man behind him, and with a crash both rolled down the almost perpendicular embankment. Followed a splash and a spout of water as they struck the river, and from every side a tornado of yells and curses. "'Tis my finish!' moaned Sammy Durgan, but his feet were flying. I, "'I've done it now. If I ran back up the cut, they'd chase me and finish me. "'Tis my finish anyway, but the engine will be the only chance I got.' Sammy Durgan streaked across the track, hurtled, tumbled, fell, and sprawled over the pile of ties, recovered himself, regained his feet, and made a frantic spring through the gangway and into the cab. With a sweep, Sammy Durgan shot the reversing lever over into the back notch, and with a single yank he wrenched the throttle wide. There was nothing of the craftsman in engine handling about Sammy Durgan at that instant, only hurry. The engine, from a passive, indolent, and inanimate thing, seemed to rise straight up in the air like an aroused and infuriated beast that had been stung. With one mad plunge it back, crashing into the buffer plates of the express car behind it, backed again and once again, and the tinkle of breaking glass sort of ricocheted along the train as one car after another added its quota of shattered window panes, while the drivers, slipping on the rails, roared around like gigantic and insensate pinwheels. Sammy Durgan snatched at the cab frame for support, and then with a yell he snatched at a shovel. A masked face showed in the gangway. Sammy Durgan brought the flat of the shovel down on the top of the man's head. The gangway was clear again. There was life for it yet. The train was backing quickly, now under the urgent prodding bucks of the engine. Sammy Durgan mopped at his face, his eyes warily on the gangways. Another man made a running jump for it. Again Sammy Durgan's shovel swung, and again the gangway was clear. Shovel poised, lurching with the lurch of the cab, red hair flaming, half terrified and half defiant, eyes shooting first to one gangway and then the other. Sammy Durgan held the cab. A minute passed with no renewal of attack. Sammy Durgan stole a quick glance over his shoulder through the cab glass up the track and with a triumphant shout he flung the shovel clanging to the iron floor plates and leaning far out of the gangway shook his fist strewn out along the right of the way masked men yelled and shouted and cursed 
but Sammy Durgan was beyond their reach, and so was the express company's safe. Yeah! screamed Sammy Durgan, wildly derisive and also belligerent in the knowledge of his own safety. Yeah, yeah, yeah! Twas me, you bloody hellions, that turned the trick on you. Twas me, Sammy Durgan, I'll have you know. Twas... Sammy Durgan turned as the express car opened, and Macy, the conductor, hatless and wild-eyed, appeared on the platform. It's all right, Macy, Sammy Durgan screeched reassuringly. It's all right, it's me, Sammy Durgan. Macy jumped from the platform to the tender, jumped over the water tank, and came down into the cab with an avalanche of coal. His mouth was twitching and jerking, but for a moment he could not speak, and then the words came like an explosion, and he shook his fist under Sammy Durgan's nose. You! You damn fathead! he roared. Why, in the double blank, blankety blank, son of blazes, are you doing? Fathead yourself! retorted Sammy Durgan promptly. There was spice in the way Sammy Durgan said it. I'm doing what you hadn't the nerve of the head to do, Macy, unless maybe you're in the gang yourself. Huh. I'm saving that safe back there in the express car. That's what I'm doing. Saving nothing, bellowed Macy crazily as he slammed the throttle shut. There, look there. He reached for Sammy Durgan's head and with both hands twisted it around and fairly flattened Sammy Durgan's nose against the cab glass. What, what is it? faltered Sammy Durgan, a little less assertively. Macy was excitable. He danced upon the cab floor as though it were a hornet's nest. What is it? he echoed in a scream. What is it? It's moving pictures, you tangle-brained, rusty-headed idiot. That's what it is. A sort of grave film seemed to spread itself over Sammy Durgan's face. Sammy Durgan stared through the cab glass. The track ahead was just disappearing from view as the engine backed around a curve. But what Sammy Durgan saw was enough. Two dripping figures were salvaging a wrecked and bedraggled photographic outfit on the river bank, close to the entrance of the cut where he had been in collision with them. An excited group of train bandits, without any masks now, were gesticulating around the marooned engineer and fireman, and in the middle distance, squatting on a rail, a man, coatless, his shirt sleeves rolled up, was making horrible grimaces as a companion bandaged his wrist. Macy's laugh rang hollow. It wasn't exactly a laugh. I don't, I don't know how much it costs stuttered the conductor demonically. But there's about four million dollars worth of film they're fishing out of the river there. And they paid a thousand dollars for the train and thirty-five minutes between stations to clear number forty. And there's about eight thousand car windows gone and one vestibule and two platforms in splinters and a man shot through the wrist. And if that crowd up there ever gets our hands on you, they'll... I think said Sammy Durgan hurriedly, that I'll get off. He edged back to the gangway and peered out. The friendly bend of the road hid the outlaws. The train was almost at a standstill, and Sammy Durgan jumped. Not on the riverside, on the other side. Sammy Durgan's destination was somewhere deep in the wooded growth that clothed the towering mountain before him. End of chapter 3, part 1「Sammy Durgan backed to the door. There he paused, blinking fast again. <sighs> Sammy Durgan backed to the door. There he paused, blinking fast again. <sighs> Sammy Durgan backed to the door. There he paused, blinking fast again. <sighs> Sammy Durgan backed to the door. There he paused, blinking fast again. Sammy Durgan backed to the door. There he paused, blinking fast again. Sammy Durgan backed to the door. There he paused, blinking fast again.
Chapter Three, Part Two of The Night Operator by Frank L. Packard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Night Operator, Chapter Three: The Apotheosis of Sammy Durgan, Part Two. There is an official record for cross-country mileage registered in the name of someone whose name is not Sammy Durgan, but it is not accurate. Sammy Durgan holds it and it was far up on the mountainside that he finally crossed the tape and collapsed breathless and gasping on a tree stump he sat there for quite a while jabbing at his streaming face with the sleeve of his jumper and there was trouble in sammy durgan's eyes and plaint in his voice when at last he spoke twenty-five dollars reward said sammy durgan wistfully and twas as good as in my pocket and now it's gone "'Tis hard luck, cruel hard luck, it is that.' Sammy Durgan's eyes roved around the woods about him and grew thoughtful. "'I was minded at the time,' said Sammy Durgan, "'that twas not the right kind of an emergency, "'and when he hears of it, Regan will be displeased. "'Now what'll I do? "'Twill do no good to return to the section shanty, "'for they'll be telegraphing Donovan to fire Sammy Durgan. "'That's me, fire Sammy Durgan.' "'Tis trouble dogs me in cruel hard luck, and all I'm asking for is a steady job and a chance.' Sammy Durgan relapsed into mournful silence and contemplation for a spell, and then his face began to clear. Sammy Durgan's optimism was like the bobbing cork. "'Tis another streak of cruel hard luck, of bitter cruel hard luck I've had this day, but am I down and out for the likes of that?' inquired sammy durgan defiantly of himself i am not replied sammy durgan buoyantly to sammy durgan tis not the first time i've been fired and did i not read that there's uh mcmurtry begging for men up there at the gap and him being a new man and unknown to me tis a job sure tis only my name might stand in the way for tis likely twill be remembered in his hearing on account of the bit of trouble down yonder uh, but tis the job i care for and not the name i'll be working for mcmurtry to-morrow morning i will that and what's more added sammy durgan beginning to blink fast i'll show em yet maria and regan and the rest of them once in every man's life he gets his chance mine ain't come yet i thought it had to-day but i was wrong but it'll come you wait i'll show em some day sammy durgan lost himself in meditation after a while he spoke again. "'I'm not sure about the law,' said Sammy Durgan, "'but on account of the fellow that the bullet hit, apart from McMurtry taking note of it, "'twould be as well anyway if I changed my name temporarily till the temper of all concerned is cooled down a bit.' Sammy Durgan rose from the stump. "'I'll start west,' said Sammy Durgan, "'and get a lift on the first way freight before the word is out.' I'm thinking they'll be asking for Sammy Durgan down at Big Cloud. And they were. It was quite true. Down at headquarters they were earnestly concerned about Sammy Durgan. Sammy Durgan had made no mistake in that respect. Fire Sammy Durgan, wired the roadmaster to the nearest station for transmission by first train to Pat Donovan, the section boss, and he got this answer back the next morning. I.P. Spears, Roadmaster, Big Cloud. Sammy Durgan missing, P. Donovan. Missing. That was it. Just that, nothing more, as though the earth had opened and swallowed him up. Sammy Durgan had disappeared. And while Carleton grew red and apoplectic over the claim sheet for damages presented by the moving picture company, and Reagan fumed and tugged at his scraggly brown moustache at thought of the damage to his rolling stock, Sammy Durgan was just missing, that was all, just missing. Nobody knew where Sammy Durgan had gone. Nobody had seen him. Station agents, operators, road bosses, section bosses, construction bosses, and everybody else were instructed to report, and they did. They reported nothing. Regan even went so far as to ask Mrs. Durgan. Is it here to taunt me, Yazar? screamed Mrs. Durgan bitterly and slammed the door in the little master mechanic's face. "'I guess,' observed Regan to himself as he gazed at the uncommunicative door panels, "'I guess maybe the neighbors have been neighborly. Hmm? 
But I guess, too, we're rid of Sammy Durgan at last. And I don't know but what that comes pretty near square in accounts for our window glass and about a million other incidentals. Only, added the little master mechanic, screwing up his eyes as he walked back to the station, only it would have been more to my liking to have got my hands on him first and got rid of him after. But Regan and Carleton and Mrs. Durgan and the Hill Division generally were not rid of Sammy Durgan, far from it. For a week he was missing, and then one afternoon young Hinton, of the division engineer's staff, strolled into the office, nodded at Carleton, and grinned at the master mechanic, who was tilted back in a chair with his feet on the window sill. "'I dropped off this morning to look over the new grading work at the Gap,' said Hinton casually. "'And I thought you might be interested to know that McMurty's got a man working for him up there by the name of Timmy O'Toole.' "'Doesn't interest me,' said Regan blandly, chewing steadily on his blackstrap. "'Try and spring it on the super, Hinton. He always bites.' "'Who's Timmy O'Toole?' smiled Carleton. Hinton squinted at the ceiling. "'Sammy Dorgan,' said Hinton casually. There wasn't a word spoken for a minute. Regan lifted his feet from the window sill and lowered his chair legs softly down to the floor as though he were afraid of making a noise, and the smile on Carleton's face sort of faded away as though a blight had withered it. "'What was that name?' said Carleton presently in a velvet voice. "'Timmy O'Toole,' said Hinton. Carleton's hand reached out, kind of as though on its own initiative, kind of as though it were just a habit, for a telegraph blank. But Regan stopped him. It wasn't often that the fat, good-natured little master mechanic was vindictive, but there were times when even Regan's soul was overburdened. "'Wait,' said Regan, with ferocious grimness. "'Wait! I'll make a better job of it than that, Carleton. I'm going up the line myself tomorrow morning on number three, and I'll drop off at the gap. Timmy O'Toole now, is it? I'll make him sick. Regan clenched his pudgy fist. When I'm through with him, he'll never have to be fired again, not on this division. Still looking for an emergency to rise to, hmm? Well, I'll accommodate him. He'll run up against the hottest emergency tomorrow morning he ever heard of. And Regan was right. That was exactly what Sammy Durgan did, only it wasn't quite the sort of emergency that Regan— But just a moment till the line's clear. There go the cautionaries against us. If it had been any other kind of a switch, it would never have happened. Let that be understood from the start, and how it ever came to be left on the main line when modern equipment was installed is a mystery, except perhaps that as it was never used, it was therefore never remembered by anybody. Nevertheless, there it stood, an old weather-beaten two-throw stub switch of the vintage of the Ark. Two-throw, mind you, when a one-throw switch, even in the days of its usefulness, would have answered the purpose just as well, better for that matter. No modern drop handle, interlocking safety device about it, not at all. A handle sticking straight out like a sore thumb that could creak around on a semicircular guide, with a rusty pin dangling from a rusty chain to lock it, if some itinerant section hand didn't forget to jab the pin back into the hole if it had the habit of worming its way out of it, it stood about a quarter of the way down the grade of the gap, which is to say about half a mile from the summit, a deserted sentinel on guard over a deserted spur that in the old construction days had been built in a few hundred yards through a soft spot in the mountainside for camp and material stores. As for the gap itself, it was not exactly what might be called a nice piece of track. Officially, the grade is an average of 4.2. Practically, it is likened to a balloon dissension by means of a parachute. It begins at the east end and climbs up in a wriggling, twisting way, hugging gray rock walls on one side and opening a canyon on the other that, as you near the summit, would make you catch your breath even to look over the edge. It is a sheer drop. And also the right-of-way is narrow, very narrow, just clearance on one side against the rock walls and a whole canyon full of nothingness at the edge of the other rail and... But here's our clearance now. 
McMurtry's camp was at the summit, and McMurtry's work, once the camp was fairly established and stores in, was to shave the pate of the summit, looking to an amelioration in the Gap's grade average, that is, its official grade average, but on the morning that Regan left Big Cloud on number three, the work was not very far along, only the preliminaries accomplished, so to speak, which were a siding at the top of the grade with storehouse and camp shanties flanking it. And on the siding that morning, just opposite the storehouse, which it might be remarked in passing, had already received its first requisition of blasting materials for the barbering of the grade that was to come, a hybrid collection of Polacks, Swedes, and Hungarians were emptying an oil tank car and discharging supplies from some flats and box cars, while on the main line track a red-haired man with leathery face was loading some grade stakes on a hand car. McMurtry, tall, lanky, and irascible, shouted at the red-haired man from a little distance up the line. Hey, Otto! The red-haired man paid no attention. Otto! It came in a bellow from the road boss. You there, Otto! You wooden-headed mud picker! Are you deaf? Sammy Durgan looked up to get a line on the disturbance and caught his breath. By glory, whispered Sammy Durgan to himself. I was near forgetting. Tis me he's yelling at. Oh, two! Yes, sir, shouted Sammy Durgan hurriedly. Oh, you woke up, have you? shrilled McMurty. Well, when you've got those stakes loaded, take them down the grade and leave them by the old spur. And take it easy on the grade and mind your brakes going down, understand? Yes, sir, said Sammy Durgan. Sammy Durgan finished loading his handcar and hopping aboard started to pump it along. At the brow of the grade he passed the oil tank car and nodded sympathetically at a round-faced, tow-headed Swede who was snatching a surreptitious drag at his pipe in the lee of the car. Like one other memorable morning in Sammy Durgan's career, it was sultry and warm with that same leisurely feeling in the air. Sammy Durgan and his handcar slid down the grade for about an eighth of a mile, rounded a curve that hid Sammy Durgan and the construction camp one from the other, continued on for another hundred yards, and came to a stop. Sammy Durgan got off. On the canyon side there was perhaps room for an agile mountain goat to stretch its legs without falling off, but on the other side, if a man squeezed in tight enough and curled his legs Turk fashion, the rock wall made a fairly comfortable backrest. "'Twas easy,' he said, "'to take it on the grade,' said Sammy Durgan reminiscently. "'And why not?' Sammy Durgan composed himself against the rock wall and produced his black cutty. Oh, "'Tis a better job than track-walking,' said Sammy Durgan judicially, "'though more arduous.' Sammy Durgan smoked on. "'But some day,' said Sammy Durgan momentously, I'll have a better one. I will that. It's a long time in coming, maybe, but it'll come. Once in every man's life a chance comes to him. Tis patience that counts, that, and rising to the emergency that proves the kind of man you are, as some day I'll prove to Mariah and Regan and the rest of them. Sammy Durgan smoked on. It was a warm summer morning, sultry even, as has been said, but it was cool and shady against the rock ledge. Peace fell upon Sammy Durgan drowsily. Also, presently, the black cutty fell, or rather slipped down into Sammy Durgan's lap without disturbing Sammy Durgan. A half hour, three quarters of an hour passed, and McMurtry, far up at the extreme end of the construction camp, let a sudden yell out of him and started on a mad run toward the tank car and the summit of the grade as a series of screeches in seven different varieties of language smote his ears and a great burst of black smoke rolling skyward met his startled gaze but fast as he ran the polacks swedes and hungarians were faster pipe smoking under discharging oil tank cars and in the shadow of a dynamite storage shed they were accustomed to but to the result a blazing oil tank car shooting a flame against the walls of the dynamite shed they were not they were only aroused to action with their lives in peril and they acted promptly and earnestly too earnestly 
Someone threw the main line open, and the others crowbarred the blazing car like mad along the few feet of siding to get it away from the storage shed, bumped it on the main line, and then their bars began to lose their purchase under the wheels. The grade accommodatingly took a hand. McMurtry, tearing along toward the scene, yelled like a crazy man, What? Block the wheels, you duke! His voice died in a gasp. Do you hear? He screamed as he got his breath again. Block the wheels! And the Polacks, the Swedes, the Hungarians, and the whatnots, scared stiff, screeched and jabbered as they watched the tank car, gaining speed with every foot it traveled, sail down the grade. And McMurtry, too late to do anything, stopped dead in his tracks, his face ashen. He pulled his watch, licked dry lips, and kind of whispered to himself, "'Number three'll be on the foot of the grade now,' whispered McMurtry, and licked his lips again. "'Oh, my God!' Meanwhile, down the grade around the bend, Sammy Durgan yawned, sat up, and cocked his ear summitwards. "'Now what the devil are them crazy foreigners yelling about?' complained Sammy Durgan unhappily. "'Tis always the same with them, like a cage full of screeching cockatoos they are.' But, being foreigners, maybe they can't help it. Tis their nature to yell without provocation, and... Sammy Durgan's ear caught a very strange sound that mingled the clack of fast-revolving wheels as they pounded the fish plates with a roar that hissed most curiously. And then Sammy Durgan's knees went loose at the joints and wobbled under him. Trailing a dense black canopy of smoke wrapped in a sheet of flame that spurted even from the trucks, the oil tank car lurched around the bend and plunged for him, and for once Sammy Durgan thought very fast. There was no room to let it pass. On one side there was just nothing, barring a precipice, and on the rock side, no matter how hard he squeezed back from the right-of-way, there wasn't any room to escape that spurting flame that even in its passing would burn him to a crisp. And with one wild squeak of terror, Sammy Durgan flung himself at his handcar, and pushing first like a maniac to start it, sprang aboard. Then he began to pump. There were a hundred yards between the bend and the scene of Sammy Durgan's siesta. Only the tank car had momentum, a whole lot of it, and Sammy Durgan had not. By the time Sammy Durgan had the handcar started, the hundred yards was twenty-five, and the monster of flame and smoke behind him was traveling two feet to his one. Sammy Durgan pumped for his life. He got up a little better speed, but the tank car still gained on him. Down the grade he went, the handcar rocking, swaying, lurching, and up and down on the handle, madly, frantically, desperately, wildly went Sammy Durgan's arms, shoulders, and head. His hat flew off, and his red hair sort of stood straight up in the wind, and his face was like chalk. Down he went, faster and faster, and the handcar, reeling like a drunken thing, took a curve with a vicious slew, and the off-wheels hung in air for an instant while Sammy Durgan bellowed in panic, then found their base again and shot along the straight. And faster and faster behind him, on wings of fire it seemed, spitting flame tongues, vomiting its black clouds of smoke like an inferno, roaring like a mighty furnace in blast, came the tank car. It was initial momentum and mass against Sammy Durgan's muscles on a handcar pump handle, and the race was not to Sammy Durgan. He cast a wild glance behind and squeaked again, and his teeth began to go like castanets as the hot breath of the thing fanned his back. "'Tis me finish!' wheezed and stuttered Sammy Durgan through bursting lungs and chattering teeth. "'Tis a dead man I am, oh, holy mother! "'Tis a dead man I am!' Ahead and to either side swept Sammy Durgan's eyes like a hunted rat's, and they held fascinated on where the old spur track led off from the main line. But it was not the spur track that interested Sammy Durgan, it was that the rock wall, diverging away from his elbow, as it were, presented a wide and open space. "'It's killed I am anyway,' moaned Sammy Durgan. "'But tis a chance. If maybe I could jump far enough there where there's room to let it pass, I, d I don't know. But tis killed I'll be anyway. Oh, holy mother, but tis a chance. Oh, holy mother!' Hissing in its wind-swept flames, belching its cataract of smoke that lay behind it up the grade like a pall of death, roaring like some insensate demon, the tank car leaped at him five yards away, and screaming now in a paroxysm of terror that had his soul in clutch, crazed with it, blind with it, Sammy Durgan jumped 
blindly, just before he reached the spur. Like a stone from a catapult, Sammy Durgan went through the air, and with a sickening thud his body crashed full into the old stub switch stand, and into the switch handle, whirled around, and he ricocheted a senseless, bleeding, shattered Sammy Durgan three yards away. It threw the switch. The handcar, already over it, sailed on down the main line and around the next bend, climbed up the front end of the 508 that was hauling number three up the grade, smashed the headlight into battered ruin, unshipped the stack, and took final lodgment on the running board, its wheels clinging like tentacles to the 508's bell and sandbox. But the tank car, with a screech of wrenching axles, a frightened, quivering stagger, took the spur, rushed like a berserker, amuck along its length, plowed up sand and gravel and dirt and rock, where there were no longer any rails, and toppled over, a spent and buckled thing, on its side. It was a flying switch that they talk of yet on the Hill Division. Number three, suspicious of the handcar, sniffed her way cautiously around the curve, and there passengers, train crew, engine crew, and Tommy Regan made an excited exodus from the train, just as McMurtry, near mad with fear, Swedes, Hungarians, and Polacks stringing out along the right-of-way behind him also arrived on the scene. Who disclaims circumstantial evidence? Regan stared at the burning oil tank up the spur, stared at the bleeding, senseless form of Sammy Durgan, and then he yelled for a doctor. But a medical man amongst the passengers was already jumping for Sammy Durgan, and McMurtry was clawing at the master mechanic's arm, stuttering out the tale of what had happened. And, and if it hadn't been for Timmy O'Toole there, stuttered McMurtry, flirting away the sweat that stood out in great nervous beads on his face, I, oh, it makes me sick to think what would have happened when that tank struck number three. Oh, something would have gone into the canyon shore. Timmy O'Toole's a... His name's Sammy Durgan, said Regan, kind of absently. I don't give a blamed hoot what his name is, declared McMurtry earnestly. He's a man with grit from his soles up and a head on him to use it with. It was three quarters of an hour ago that I sent him down, so he must have been near the top on his way back when he saw that tank car coming, and he took the one chance there was to try and beat it to the spur here to save number three. And it was so close on him, for it's a cinch he hadn't time to stop, that he had to jump for the switch with about one chance in ten for his own life. See? A blind man could see it, said Regan heavily. But Sammy Durgan. He reached uncertainly toward his hip pocket for his chewing, and then with sudden emotion the big-hearted, fat little master mechanic bent over Sammy Durgan. God bless the man, blurted out Regan, and then to the doctor, Will he live? Oh, yes, I think so the doctor answered. He's pretty badly smashed up, though. Sammy Durgan's lips were moving. Regan leaned close to catch the words. A steady job, murmured Sammy Durgan. Never get a chance. But some day it'll come. I'll show him Maria and Regan and the rest of them. You have, Sammy, said Regan in a low, anxious voice. It's all right, Sammy. It's all right, old boy. Just pull around and you can have any blame thing you want on the Hill Division. The doctor smiled sympathetically at Regan. He's delirious, you know, he explained kindly. What he says doesn't mean anything. Regan looked up with a kind of grim smile. Don't it? inquired Regan softly. Then he cleared his throat and tugged at his scraggly brown mustache, both ends of it. That's what I used to think myself said the fat little master mechanic, sort of as though he were apostrophizing the distant peaks across the canyon, and not as though he were talking to the doctor at all. But I guess, I guess I know Sammy Durgan better than I did. Hmm? End of chapter 3 Chapter 4, Part 1 of The Night Operator this is a LibriVox recording. It is in the public domain. The Night Operator by Frank L. Packard Chapter 4 The Wrecking Boss Part 1 
Opinions, right or wrong, on any subject, are a matter of individuality. There have been different opinions about Flanagan on the Hill Division, but the story is straight enough. From car tink to superintendent, there has never been any difference of opinion about that. Flanagan was the wrecking boss. Tommy Regan said the job fitted Flanagan, for it took a hard man for the job, and Flanagan, bar none, was the hardest man on the payroll. Hardest at crooking elbows in McGuire's Blazing Star Saloon, hardest with his fists, and hardest of all when it came to getting at the heart of some scalding, mangled horror of death and ruin that a man wouldn't be called a coward to turn from sick. Flanagan looked it. He stood six feet one in his stockings, and his chest and shoulders were like the front-end view you'd get looking at a sturdy, well-grown ox. He wasn't pretty. His face was scarred with cuts and burns enough to stall any German dueling student on a siding till the rails rusted, and the beard he grew to hide these multitudinous disfigurements just naturally came out in tussocks. He had black eyes that could go coal-black and lose their pupils, and a shock of black hair that fell into them half the time. Also, he had a tongue that wasn't elegant. That was Flanagan. Flanagan the wrecking boss. There's no accounting for the way some things come about, and it's pretty hard to call the turn of the card when Dame Fortune deals the bank. It's a trite enough saying that it is the unexpected that happens in life, but the reason it's trite is because it's immeasurably true. Flanagan growled and swore and cursed one night, coming back from a bit of a spill up the line, because they stalled him and his wrecking outfit for an hour about half a mile west of Big Cloud. The reason being that, like the straw that broke the camel's back, a circus train in from the east, billed for a three days layoff at Big Cloud, had, seeking siding, temporarily choked the yards, already glutted with traffic, until the mix-up Gleason the yardmaster had to wrestle with would have put a problem in differential calculus into the kindergarten class. Flanagan was very dirty and withal very tired, and when finally they gave him the clear and his flat and caboose and his staggering derrick rumbled sullenly down toward the roundhouse and shops, the sight of gilded cages, gaudily decorated cars, and converted pullmans that were second-class tourist equipment painted white did not assuage his feelings. Neither was there enchantment for him in the roars of multifarious beasts, nor in the hybrid smells that assailed his nostrils from the general direction of the menagerie. Flanagan, for an hour's loss of sleep, with heartiness and abandon, consigned that particular circus, also all others, and everything thereunto pertaining, from fangless serpents to steam calliopes, to regions that are popularly credited with being somewhat warmer than the torrid zone on the hottest day in midsummer. But then uh, Flanagan did not know. Opinions differ. Flanagan was about the last man on earth that anyone on the Hill Division would have picked out for a marrying man, and equally true the other way round, about the last man they would have picked out as one a pretty girl would want to marry. With her, maybe, it was the strength of the man, since they say that comes first with women. With him, maybe, it was just a trim, little, brown-eyed, brown-haired figure that could ride with the grace of a fairy. Anyway... The only thing about it that didn't surprise anyone was the fact that when it came, it came as sudden and quick as a head-on smash around a ninety-degree curve. That was Flanagan's way, for Flanagan, if he was nothing else, was impulsive. That night, Flanagan cursed the circus. The next day, he saw Daisy McQueen riding in the street parade. But this isn't the story of Flanagan's courtship. Not but that the courtship of any man like Flanagan would be worth the telling, only there are other things. At first, Big Cloud winked and chuckled slyly to itself, and then when the circus left and Flanagan got a week off and left with it, it guffawed outright. But when, at the end of that week, Flanagan brought back Mrs. Flanagan, nay, Daisy McQueen, 
Big Cloud stuck its tongue in its cheek, wagged its head, and waited developments. This is the story of the developments. Maybe that same impulsiveness of Flanagan's, that could be blind and bull-headed, coupled with a passion that was like a devil's when aroused, was to blame. Maybe the women of Big Cloud, following the lead of Mrs. McAloon, the engineer's wife, and the leader of society circles, who shook her fiery red head and turned up her Celtic nose disdainfully at Daisy McQueen, had something to do with it. Maybe Daisy herself had a little pride. But what's the use of speculating? It all goes back to the same beginning. Opinions differ. Tongues wagged. Flanagan listened. That's the gist of it. But once for all, let it be said and understood that Daisy McQueen was as straight as they make them. She hadn't been brought up the way Mrs. McAloon and her coterie had, and she liked to laugh, liked to play, liked to live, and not exist in a humdrum way, ever over wash tubs and a cook stove though all credit to her who hadn't been used to them she never shirked one nor the other the women's ideas about circuses and circus performers were putting it mildly uh, puritanical but the men liked daisy mcqueen and took no pains to hide it they clustered around her and before long she ruled them all imperially with a nod of her pretty head and as a result the women's ideas from puritanical became more so which is human nature, Big Cloud, or anywhere else. At first Flanagan was proud of the little wife he had brought to Big Cloud, proud of her for the very attitude adopted toward her by his mates, but as the months went by, gradually the wagging tongues got in their work, gradually Flanagan began to listen, and the jealousy that was his by nature above the jealousy of most men commenced to smolder into flame just a rankling jealousy directed against no one in particular, just jealousy. Things up at the little house off Main Street where the Flanagans lived weren't as harmonious as they had been. In the beginning, Daisy, not treating the matter seriously, answered Flanagan with a laugh. Finally, she answered him not at all. And that stage unfortunately far from unique in other homes than Flanagan's the world over, was reached where only some one act, word, or deed was needed to bring matters to a head. Perhaps, after all, there was poetic justice in Flanagan's cursing of the circus, for it was the circus that supplied that one thing needed. Not that the circus came back to town, it didn't, but a certain round, little, ferret-eyed, short, pompadour-haired, waxed-mustached, perfumed, Signor Ferraringi, the ringmaster, did. Ferraringi was a scoundrel. What he got he deserved, there was never any doubt about that, but that night Flanagan, when he walked into the house, saw only Ferraringi on his knees before Daisy, heard only impassioned flowery words, and in the blind fury that transformed him from man to beast, the scorn, contempt, and horror in Daisy's eyes, the significance of the rigid little figure with tight-clenched hands was lost. Ferran Ringi had been in love with Daisy. Flanagan knew that, and his seething brain remembered that. The circus people had told him so. Daisy had told him so. Ferran Ringi had told him so with a snarl and a threat, and he had laughed. Then, one instant, Flanagan hung upon the threshold. He was not a pretty sight. Back from a wreck he was still in his overalls, and these were smeared with blood. Four carloads of steers had gone into premature shambles in the ditch. One instant Flanagan hung there, his face working convulsively, and then he jumped, his left hand locked into the collar of the ringmaster's coat, his arms straightened like the tautening chains of his own derrick crane, and as the other came off his knees and upright from the yank, Flanagan's right swung a terrific full-arm smash that, landing a little above the jaw, plastered one side of that tonsorial work of art, the waxed and curled mustache, flat into Ferran Ringi's cheek. Ferran Ringi's answer, as he wriggled free, was a torrent of malediction and a blinding flash. Daisy screamed. The shot missed. 
but the powder singed Flanagan's face. It was the only shot that Ferenringi fired. With a roar, high-pitched like the maddening trumpet of an elephant amuck, Flanagan, with a single blow, sent the revolver sailing, ceiling high. Then his arms, like steel piston rods, worked in and out, and his fist drummed an awful, merciless tattoo upon the ringmaster. The smoke from the shot filled the room with pungent odor. Chairs and furniture, overturned, broken, crashed to the floor. Daisy, wild-eyed with parted lips, dumb with terror, crouched against the wall, her hands clasped to her breast. But before Flanagan's eyes all was red, red. A battered, bruising, reeling, staggering form before him curled up suddenly and slid in a heap at his feet. Flanagan, with groping hands and twitching fingers, reached for it, and then with a rush other forms, many of them, came between him and what was on the floor. It was very good for Farron Ringe, very good, for that was all that saved him. Flanagan was seeing only red. The neighbors lifted the stunned ringmaster limp as rags to his feet. Flanagan brushed his great fist once across his eyes in a half-dazed way and glared at the room full of people. Suddenly he heaved forward, pushing those nearest him violently toward the door. "'Get out of here!' he bellowed hoarsely. "'Get out of here! Curse you to your hair! Get out!' There were men in that little crowd, men besides the three or four women, Mrs. McAloon amongst them, men not reckoned over faint in spirit of big cloud by those who knew but they knew flanagan and they went went half carrying half dragging the ringmaster oiled and perfumed now in a fashion grimly different than before get out roared flanagan again to hurry them and as the last one disappeared he whirled on daisy and you too he snarled get out terrified, shaken by the scene as she was, his words, their implication, their injustice, whipped her into scorn and anger. White-lipped, she stared at him for an instant. You dare! She burst out. You dare to! Get out! Flanagan's voice in his passion was a thick, stumbling, guttural whisper. Get out! Go back to your circus! Go where you like! Get out! His hand dove into his pocket, and its contents, bills and coins, what there was of them, he flung upon the table. Get out! As far as all I've got will take you! Daisy McQueen was proud. Perhaps, though not above the pride of other women, the blood was hot in her cheeks. Her big brown eyes had a light in them near to that light with which she had faced Ferran Ringi but a short time before. Her breath came in short, hard little gasps. For a full minute she did not speak, and then the words came cold as death. Some day, some day, Michael Flanagan, you'll get what you deserve. That's what I'm getting now, what I deserve, he flung back. Then, halting in the doorway, you understand, huh? Get out. I'm letting you down easy. Get out of Big Cloud. Get out before I'm back. Number fifteen will be in an hour. You better take her. Flanagan stepped out on the street. A curious little group had collected two houses down in front of Mrs. McAloon's. Flanagan glanced at them, muttered a curse, and then head down between his shoulders, clenched fists rammed in his pockets, he headed in the other direction toward Main Street. Five minutes later he pushed the swinging doors of the Blazing Star open and walked down the length of the room to where Pete McGuire, the proprietor, lounged across the bar. Pete, he jerked out his words hoarsely, next Tuesday's payday. Is my face good enough until then? McGuire looked at him curiously. The news of the fracas had not yet reached the Blazing Star. Oh, I sure, said he. Sure it is, Flanagan, if you want. What's... Then let him come my way, Flanagan rapped out with a savage laugh, and let him come fast. Flanagan was the wrecking boss. A hard man, Regan had called him, and he was. A product of the wild, rough, pioneering life. One of those men who followed the grim-faced, bearded corps of engineers as they pitted their strength against the sullen gray of the mighty Rockies, from the eastern foothills to the plains of the Sierras, fighting every inch of their way with indomitable perseverance and daring over chasms and gorges, through tunnels and cuts, 
in curves and levels and grades, against obstacles that tried their souls, against death itself, taping the thin steel lines they left behind them with their own blood. Hard? Yes, Flanagan was hard. Uncultured, rough, primal, he undoubtedly was. A brute man, perhaps, full of the elemental, fiery, hot-headed. His passions alone swayed him. That side of Flanagan, the years and the very environment in which he had lived them, had developed to the full. The other side had been untouched. What Flanagan did that night, another might not have done, or he might. The judging of men is a grave business, best left alone. Flanagan let go his hold then, not at once, but gradually. That night spent in the blazing star was the first of others, others that followed insidiously, each closer upon the former's heels. Daisy had gone, had gone that night. Where, he did not know, and told himself he did not care. He grew moody, sullen, uncompanionable. Big Cloud took sides. The women for Flanagan, the men for the wife. Flanagan hated the women, avoided the men, and went to the blazing star. There was only one result, the inevitable one. Regan, kindly for all his gruffness, understanding in a way, stood between Flanagan and the super, and warned Flanagan oftener than most men were warned on the Hill Division. Nor were his warnings altogether without effect. Flanagan would steady up, temporarily, maybe for a week, then off again. Steady up just long enough to keep putting off and postponing the final reckoning. And then one day, some six months after Daisy Flanagan had gone away, the master mechanic warned him for the last time. I'm through with you, Flanagan, he said. Understand that? I'm out from under, and next time you'll talk to Carlton. And what he'll have to say won't take long, about two seconds. You know Carlton, don't you? Well, then, what? It was just a week to a day after that that Flanagan cut loose and wild again. He made it night and a day of it, and then another. After that, though by that time Flanagan was quite unaware of the fact, some of the boys got him home, dumped him on his bed, and left him to his reflections, which were blank. Flanagan slept it off, and it took him about eighteen hours to do it. When he came to himself, he was in a humor that, far from being happy, was atrocious. Likewise, there were bodily ailments. Flanagan's head was bad, and felt as though a gang of boilermakers working against time were driving rivets in it. He procured himself a bracer and went back to bed. This resulted in a decidedly improved physical condition. But when he arose late in the afternoon, any improvement there might have been in his mental state was speedily dissipated. Flanagan found a letter shoved under his door, postmarked the day before, and with it an official manila envelope from the super's office. He opened the letter and read it, read it again while his jaws worked and the red surged in a passion into his face. Then with an oath he tore it savagely into shreds, flung the bits on the floor and stamped upon them viciously with his heavy nail-heel boot. The official manila he did not open at all. A guess was enough for that a curt request to present himself in the super's office, probably. Flanagan glared at it, then grabbed his hat and started down for the station. There was no idea of shirking it. Flanagan wasn't that kind at any time, and just now his mood, if anything, spurred him on rather than held him back. Flanagan welcomed the prospect of a row about anything with anybody at that moment, if only a war of words. Carlton's office was upstairs over the ticket office and next to the dispatcher's room then, for the station did duty for headquarters and everything else. Not now, it's changed now, and there's a rather imposing gray stone structure where the old wooden shack used to be. But no matter, that's the way it was then, for those were the early days when the road was young and in the making. Flanagan reached the station, climbed the stairs, and pushed Carlton's door open with little ceremony. "'You want to see me?' 
he demanded gruffly as he stepped inside. Carleton, sitting at his desk, looked up and eyed the wrecking boss coolly for a minute. "'No, Flanagan,' he said curtly. "'I don't.' "'Then what in blazes do you send for me for?' Flanagan flung out in a growl. "'See here, Flanagan,' snapped Carleton. "'I've no time to talk to you. You can read, can't you? You're out.' Flanagan blinked. "'Was that what was in the letter?' "'It was. Just that,' said Carleton grimly. "'Hell!' Flanagan's short laugh held a jeering note of contempt. "'I didn't open it. Or maybe I'd have known, huh?' Carleton's eyes narrowed. "'Well, you know now, don't you?' "'Sure.' Flanagan scowled and licked his lips. "'I'm out. Thrown out, and—' "'Then get out,' Carleton cut in sharply. "'You've had more chances than any man ever got before from me, thanks to Regan. But you've had your last, and talking won't do you any good now.' Flanagan stepped nearer to the desk. Talking. Who's talking? He flared in sudden bravado. Didn't I tell you I didn't read your damned letter? Didn't I? Huh? Didn't I? Do you think I'd crawl to you or any man for a job? I'm out, am I? Do you think I came down to ask you to take me back? I'll see you rot first. The hell with the job. See? Few men on the Hill Division ever saw Carlton lose his temper. It wasn't Carlton's way of doing things. He didn't lose it now, but his words were like trickling drops of ice water. Sometimes, Flanagan, he said, to make a man like you understand, one has to use your language. You say you'd see me rot before you asked me for the job back again. Very well. I'd rot before I gave it to you after this. Now, will you get out or be thrown out? For a moment it looked as though Flanagan was going to mix in there and then. His eyes went ugly and his fists, horny and gnarled, doubled into knots as he glared viciously at the super. Carlton, who was afraid of no man or any aggregation of men, his face stern set and hard, leaned back in his swivel chair and waited. A tense minute passed. Then Flanagan's better sense weighed down the balance and without so much as a word he turned, went out of the room, and stamped heavily down the stairs. Goaded into it, or through unbridled, ill-advised impulse, men say rash things sometimes. Afterward, both Flanagan and Carleton were to remember their own and the other's words, and the futility of them. Nor was it to be long afterward. Without warning, without so much as a premonition, quick and sudden as dooms. Things happen in railroading. End of chapter 4, part 1。Chapter 4, part 2 of The Night Operator。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Night Operator by Frank L. Packard Chapter 4 Part 2 It was half-past five when Flanagan went out of the super's office. It was but ten minutes later when, before he had decanted a drop from the bottle he had just lifted to fill his glass, he slapped the bottle back on the bar of the blazing star with a sudden jerk. From down the street in the direction of the yards boomed three long blasts from the shop whistle, the wrecking signal. It came again and again. Men around him began to move. Chairs from the little tables were pushed hurriedly back. The bell in the English chapel took up the alarm. It stirred the blood in Flanagan's veins and whipped it to his cheeks in fierce excitement. It was the call to arms. He turned from the bar and stopped like a man stunned. There had been times in the last six months when he had not responded to that call, because deaf to everything he had not heard it. Then it had been his call, the call for the wrecking crew, and first of all for the wrecking boss. Now there was a dazed look on his face and his lips worked queerly. It was not for him. He was barred. Out. Slowly he turned back to the bar, rested his foot on the rail, and with a mirthless laugh and a shrug of his shoulders reached for the bottle again. He poured the whiskey glass full to the brim, 
and laughed once more and shrugged his shoulders as his fingers curled around it. He raised the glass and held it poised halfway to his lips. Quick running steps came up the street, the swinging doors of the blazing star burst open, and a call boy shoved in his head. Wreckers out! Wreckers out! he bawled. Number eighty's gone to glory in spider cut. Everybody's killed! And he was gone. A grimy-faced harbinger of death and disaster, gone, speeding with his summons to wherever men were gathered throughout the little town. An instant Flanagan stood motionless as one transformed from flesh to sculptured clay. Then the glass slid from his fingers and crashed into tinkling splinters on the floor. The liquor splashed his boots. Number 80 was the eastbound Coast Express. Like one who moves in unknown places through the dark, so then Flanagan moved toward the door. Men looked at him in amazement and stood aside to let him pass. Something was tugging at his heart, beating at his brain, impelling him forward, a force irresistible that in its first sudden overwhelming surge he could not understand, could not grasp, could not focus into concrete form, could only obey. He passed out through the doors, and then for the first time a cry rang from his lips. There was no halting, stumbling, uncertain steps now. Men running down the street called to Flanagan as he sped past them. Flanagan made no answer, did not look their way. His face, strained and full of dumb anguish, was set toward the station. He gained the platform and raced along it. Shouts came from across the yards. Up and down the spurs fluttered the foreshortened little yard engine, coughing sparks and wheezing from her exhaust as she bustled the wrecking train together. Lamps swung and twinkled like fireflies, for it was just opening spring and the dark fell early, and in front of the roundhouse the 1014, blowing hard from her safety under a full head of steam like a thoroughbred that sensed the race was ready on the table. With a heave of his great shoulders and a sweep of his arms, Flanagan won through the group of trainmen, shop hands, and loungers clustered around the door and took the stairs four at a leap. A light burned in the super's office, but the voices came from the dispatcher's room, and there in the doorway Flanagan halted, halted just for a few seconds' pause while his eyes swept the scene before him. Regan, the master mechanic by the window, was mouthing curses under his breath as men do in times of stress. Spence, the dispatcher, white-faced, the hair straggling into his eyes, was leaning over the key under the green-shaded lamp, over the key clearing the line while the sounder clicked in his ears of ruin and of lives gone out. Harvey, the division engineer, was there, pulling savagely at a briar with empty bowl, and at the dispatcher's elbow stood Carlton, a grim commander, facing tidings of disaster, his shoulders braced and bent a little forward as though to take the blow, his jaws clamped tight till the lips compressed were bloodless, and the chiseled lines on his face told of the bitterness in his heart. Then Flanagan stepped forward. Carlton, he cried, and his words came like panting sobs. Carlton, give me back my job. It was no place for Flanagan. Carlton's cup was already full to overflowing, and he swung on Flanagan like a flash. His hand lifted and pointed to the door. "'Get out of here,' he said between his teeth. "'Carlton!' cried Flanagan again, and his arms went out in supplication toward the super. "'Carlton, give me back my job. Give it back to me for tonight, just for tonight!' "'No!' the single word came from Carlton's lip like a thunderclap. Flanagan shivered a little and shrank back. "'Just for tonight,' he mumbled hoarsely. "'Just for—' "'No!' Carlton's voice rang hard as flint. "'I tell you no! Get out of here!' Harvey moved suddenly, threateningly, toward Flanagan, and as suddenly Flanagan, roused by the act, brushed the division engineer aside like a plaything, sprang forward, and with a quick, fierce grip caught Carlton's arms and pinioned them vice-like to his sides. "'And I tell you yes!' His voice rose dominant with the power, the will that shook him now to the depths of his turbulent soul. As a man who knows no law, no obstacle, no restraint, as a man who would batter down the gates of hell itself to gain his end, so then was Flanagan. I tell you yes, I tell you yes. My wife and baby's in that wreck tonight. Turmoil, shouts, 
the short quick intermittent hiss of steam as the ten fourteen her cylinder cocks opened back down the platform the clash of coupling cars a jumbled medley of sounds floated up from the yard without but within the little room the chattering sounder for the moment stilled there was a silence as of death and no man among them moved or spoke flanagan gray-faced gasping his mighty grip still on carleton his head thrown forward close to the other stared into the super's face and for a long minute in the twitching muscles of the big wrecker's face in the look that man reads seldom in his fellow's eyes carleton drew the fearful picture lived the awful story that the babbling wire had told royal carleton square man and big of heart his voice broke god help you flanagan go no word came from flanagan's lips only a queer choking sound as his hands dropped to his sides only a queer choking sound as he turned suddenly and jumped for the door on the stairs dorsey the driver of the ten fourteen coming up for his orders passed flanagan's bad spill i hear growled the engineer as he went by the five hundred and five's pony truck jumped the rails on the lower curve and everything's in the ditch old burke's gone out and a heap of the passengers with him i flanagan heard no more he was on the platform now coupled behind the derrick crane and the tool car were two coaches improvised ambulances and into these latter instead of the tool car the men of the wrecking crew were piling a bad smash brought luxury for them shouts cries hubbub a babel of voices were around him but in his brain repeated and repeated over and over again lived only a phrase from the letter he had torn to pieces stamped under heel that afternoon the words were swimming before his eyes michael dear we've both been wrong i'm bringing baby back on the coast express friday night men with big black bags brushed by them and tumbled into the rear coach the doctor's a big cloud to the last one of them dorsey came running from the station a bit of tissue his orders fluttering in his hand and sprang for the cab ten fourteen's exhaust burst suddenly into quick deafening explosions the sparks shot volleying heavenward from her short stack the big whirling drivers were beginning to bite and then through the gangway after the engineer into the cab swung flanagan flanagan the wrecking boss spider cut is the eastern gateway of the rockies and it lies as the crow flies sixteen miles west of big cloud but the right-of-way as it twists and turns circling and dodging the buttes that grow from mounds to foothills makes it on the blueprints twenty one decimal seven the running time of the fast flyers on this stretch is oh what of that Dorsey that night smashed all records, and the medical men in the rear coach tell to this day how they clung for life and limb to their seats and to each other, and most of them will admit, which is admitting much, that they were frightened, white-lipped men with broken nerves. As the wreck special, with a clash and clatter, shattered over the switches in the upper yard and nosed the main line, Stan Willard, who had the shovel end of it, with a snatch at the chain swung open the furnace door and a red glow lighted up the heavens dorsey turned in his seat and looked at the giant form of the wrecking boss behind him they had told him the story in the office the eyes of the two met flanagan's lips moved dumbly and with a curious pleading motion he gestured toward the throttle dorsey opened another notch he laughed a grim hard laugh i know he shouted over the roar i know leave it to me flanagan the bark of the exhaust came quicker and quicker swelled and rose into the full deep-toned thunder of a single note notch by notch dorsey opened out the ten fourteen notch by notch and the big mountain racer answering like a mettlesome steed to the touch of the whip leapt forward ever faster into the night now the headlight played on shining steel ahead now suddenly threw a path of light across the short yellow stubble of a rising butte and dorsey checked grudgingly for an instant as they swung the curve just for an instant then into the straight again with wide-flung throttle it was mad work and in that reeling dizzy cab no man spoke 
the sweep of the singing wind, the wild tattoo of beating trucks, the sullen whirr of flying drivers was in their ears, while behind the derrick crane, the tool car and the coaches writhed and wriggled, swayed and lurched, tearing at their couplings, bouncing on their trucks, jerking viciously as each slew took up the axle play, rolling, pitching crazily like cockle shells tossed on an angry sea. Now they tore through a cut, and the walls took up the deafening roar and echoed and re-echoed it back in volume a thousandfold. Now into the open, and the sudden contrast was like the gasping breath of an imprisoned thing escaped. Now over culverts, trestles, spans, hollow, reverberating, the speed was terrific. Over his levers, bounding on his seat, Dorsey, tense and strained, leaned far forward, following the leaping headlights' glare, while staggering like a drunken man to keep his balance, the sweat standing out in glistening beads upon his grimy face, Stan Willard watched the flickering needle on the gauge, and his shovel clanged and swung, and in the corner, back of Dorsey, bent low to brace himself, thrown backward and forward with every lurch, in the fantastic dancing light, like some tigerish outraged animal crouched to spring flanagan with head drawn into his shoulders jaws out thrust stared over the engineer's back stared with never a look to right or left stared through the cab glass to the right of way ahead stared toward spider cut again and again with sickening giddy shock wheel base lifted from the swing the ten fourteen struck the tangents hung a breathless space and with a screech of crunching flanges found the rails once more again and again but the story of that ride is the doctor's story they tell it best dorsey made the run that night from big cloud to spider cut twenty one point seven miles in nineteen minutes there have been bad spills on the hill division bad spills but there have never been worse than on that friday night when the five oh five jumped the rails at the foot of the curve coming down the grade just east of spider cut shot over the embankment and piled the coast express mahogany sleepers and all into splintered wreckage forty feet below the right of way as dorsey checked and with screaming brake shoes the ten fourteen slowed Flanagan, with a wild cry, leaped from the cab and dashed up the track ahead of the still-moving pilot. It was light enough. The cars of the wreck nearest him, the mail and baggage cars, had caught, and fanned by the wind into yellow flames were blazing like a huge bonfire. Shouts arose from below, cries, anguish, piercing from those imprisoned in the wreck. Figures, those of the crew and passengers who had made their escape, were moving hither and thither, working as best they might, pulling others through shattered windows and upcanted doors, laying those who were past all knowing beside the long row of silent forms already tenderly stretched along the edge of the embankment. A man, with face cut and bleeding, came running toward Flanagan. It was Kingsley, conductor of number 80. Flanagan jumped for him, grasped him by the shoulders, and stared without a word into his face. But Kingsley shook his head. "'I don't know, Flanagan,' he choked. "'She was in one of the first class, just ahead of the Pullmans. There's—there's there's no one come out of that car yet.' He turned away his head. "'We couldn't get to it.' "'Couldn't?' get to it flanagan's lips repeated the phrase mechanically then he looked and understood the grim significance of the words he laughed suddenly jarring hoarse as it is not good to hear men laugh and with that laugh flanagan went into the fight the details of that night no one man knows there in the shadow of the gray-walled rockies men flint-hearted calloused rough and ready though they were sobbed as they toiled and when the derrick tackles creaked and moaned, axe and pick and bar swung and crashed and tore through splintering glass and ripping timber, what men could do they did. And through the hours Flanagan led them, tough, grizzled men, more than one dropped from sheer weariness. But ever Flanagan's great arms rose and fell, ever his mighty shoulders heaved, ever he led them on. What men could do they did. But it was graying dawn before they opened a way to the heart of the wreck, the first-class coach that once ahead of the Pullmans was under them now. 
Flanagan, gaunt, burned and bleeding, a madman with reeling brain, staggered toward the jagged hole that they had torn in the flooring of the car. They tried to hold him back. The man who had spurred them through the night alternately with lashing curse and piteous prayer, the man who had worked with demon strength as no three men among them had worked, the man who was tottering now at the end in mind and body, they tried to hold him back for mercy's sake. But Flanagan shook them off and went, went laughing again the same fearful laugh with which he had begun the fight. He found her there, found her with a little bundle lying in the crook of her outstretched arm. She moaned and held it toward him, but Flanagan had gone his limit. His work was done. The tension broke. And when they worked their way to the far end of the car after him, those hard, grim-visaged followers of Flanagan, they found a man squatted on an upended seat, a woman beside him, death and desolation and huddled shapes around them, dandling a tiny infant in his arms, crooning a lullaby through cracked lips, crooning a lullaby to a little one, long hushed, already in its last sleep. Opinions differ, but Big Cloud today sides about solid with Regan. Flanagan, says the master mechanic. Flanagan's a pretty good reckon, boss, pretty good. I, I don't know of any better, since the Almighty had him on the carpet. He's got a plot up on the butte behind the town, he and Daisy with a little mound on it. They go up there every Sunday, never known them to miss. A man ain't likely to fall off the right away again as long as he does that, is he? Well, then forget it. He's been doing that for a year now. What? End of chapter 4